It's the beginning of the fall, 2008, and Mark Cahotis' hedge fund, Copper River, is staring down the opportunity of a lifetime. The firm has placed big bets that the stock market is about to crash, and that's exactly what's starting to happen. Bear Stearns collapsed a few months ago, and the S&P 500 is already down about 10%. By November, that decline would grow to nearly 50%. But there was no party at Copper River to celebrate their perfect positioning. See, Copper River had gone out of business in September. Mark Cahotis is something of a celebrity in the financial Twitter community. He's a foul-mouthed short seller whose biggest hits have involved takedowns of companies engaged in massive fraud. His latest win was on Mimetics, who went so far as to call in political favors to have the FBI sent to his house to intimidate him. He's sort of a classic anti-hero, and if you follow Cahotis' Twitter page for any amount of time, you'll realize that... One of his defining characteristics, slotting perfectly into that role, is that he hates the establishment. Like, he really hates them. What happened in September of 2008 is certainly not the only reason, but it definitely didn't help. According to Cahotis, Copper River was up about 35% on the year, already a massive outperformance relative to the market, which was down. At this point, the U.S. government was getting extremely nervous about a possible collapse of the banking system, which had the potential to bring down the entire world economy. Obviously, that would be bad. One of the strategies they used to try and stave off this worst-case scenario was to implement two rules that were direct attacks on short sellers. See, the government was worried about a self-fulfilling prophecy happening where a perfectly healthy bank would suffer falling share prices from all the short selling. They then would be perceived as failing by the public. Once this perception set in, there might then be a run on the bank by depositors or a loss of business from commercial customers who were uneasy doing business with an entity that might disappear overnight. These disruptions would then lead to the actual bank failure of what had been a healthy bank. Anyway, the rules implementation led to a dramatic rally in share prices of some of the market's most beaten down stocks. The rally took a chunk out of Copper River's returns. Now, Cahotis was only up about 20%. It wasn't a pleasant couple of days, but he was still fine. Plus, he felt that if steps that dramatic were being taken, then the system must really be on the brink, and he was still perfectly positioned to profit off a market implosion. But then his phone rang. It was from Goldman Sachs, Copper River's prime broker. They told him that they were changing his haircut from 30% to 60%. In non-jargon speak, what they were telling him was they were worried about the volatility in his portfolio and decided that he needed to have more cash to back up the positions he'd been taking. They told him they needed $700 million and they needed it right away. Otherwise, they were going to start liquidating his positions. For a $2 billion fund who at the time had some of its money frozen because it was tied up in the whole failure of Lehman Brothers, basically they were asking for an impossible amount. So the only way that Cahotis was going to be able to get Copper River back into compliance was by closing out his positions. So that's what he started doing. He was covering his short positions and selling whatever long positions he had trying not to impact the market too much, and then he gets another call. Goldman tells him that this orderly selling that he's doing, it's not going to work. They needed their money right now, and since he hadn't gotten it to them, they said they were taking over. Oh, and by the way, they also decided that the haircut was going to get moved up to 70%. Here's what Kodas had to say about Ravi Singh, the person at Goldman who was tasked with giving him this news and enforcing the policy. And this cocksucker, motherfucker, Robbie Singh, who I've never heard of before, and all my guys were, I couldn't talk to anyone who I knew there. So I put this Robbie Singh on the phone. I said, you know, you're going to, if you do this, you're going to put me out of business. Now, 
If you're watching this video around when it was first published, you know what can happen when a prime broker takes over a client account and starts liquidating as that's exactly what happened with Archegos recently. Look at this Viacom chart, for example. That's what happens when a gigantic seller shows up and the market isn't ready. Now, look at these charts of some of the names owned by Cahotis in Copper River. The market is collapsing, but the liquidation is causing all of his shorts to go up. This makes the price for each subsequent share that he needs to buy or sell even worse, so he needs to liquidate more and more to get in compliance with the haircut. The situation is made even worse by something that Cahotis finds out is going on inside Goldman Sachs. Goldman's trading unit somehow knew in advance what was about to happen. Someone leaked Copper River's situation to them. This meant that they could front-run his trade. They'd buy in all the names that he was going to have to buy to cover his short positions, forcing up their price or at least supporting it when it should have been crashing, and then wait for his fund's shares to hit the market to make their exit. This meant the trades were going against him even before he could start the liquidation. Finally, mercifully, the fund gets into compliance and the bleeding stops. Copper River is now down 20%. It's horrible and unfair, but they seem to have survived. Cahotis gets to talk to one of his guys at Goldman, not Ravi Singh, who he hadn't known previously, called Sussman. Sussman confirms that he's okay, finally. And even better, since the market is imploding, he starts making money again. Maybe the situation could be salvaged. He allows himself to have hope. Except, Goldman wasn't done. They call again. They decided that his haircut was going to be a full 100%. Again, he can't raise the cash. Again, they take over the account. And this time, when they finish, his fund is down 52%. He's out of business. He has to call all of his clients and tell them the exact moment he'd been preparing for. The reason they'd put their millions under his care, well, it had come and he'd failed. Obviously, the big question here is why? Sure, Cahotis' trades had moved against him after the short-selling ban went into effect, but it hadn't been all that bad. So what was Goldman afraid of? It's important to note here that there are federal requirements regarding margin and how much collateral a fund must maintain, but Copper River was never in violation of those rules. The haircuts, the hundreds of millions they were forced to put up, were strictly what are called house rules. They existed because Goldman said so. This doesn't seem to make sense. Cahotis had been a client of Goldman for over 20 years, and over that time, he says his fund had paid them more than $100 million in fees. Now they were taking actions that would obviously destroy his firm, and in doing so, destroy that lucrative revenue stream they had from keeping him as a client. Cahotis has a theory, though. In a court case only tangentially related to this situation, he took the opportunity to deliver testimony under oath about what Goldman might have been up to. Remember, if you've ever shorted a stock or even just read about how that works, you need to first be able to borrow that stock from someone. Otherwise, it's called naked shorting, which is in many cases illegal. If you're just a regular person, you probably don't think about this too much if you go to short a stock on E-Trade or Robinhood. It just sort of happens. But when you're running a billion-dollar hedge fund, shorting millions of shares at a time means that you have to have someone find those ahead of time. Cotus always considered Goldman the best in the business at locating shares that he would need to borrow to put on his short positions. They seem to be able to find shares when others couldn't, or charge them a lower rate than their competitors. But what if the reason Goldman could find those shares to borrow that kept Cahotis a happy client and earned them hundreds of millions in fees was that they were making it up? Sometimes they couldn't find the shares to borrow, but they told them they did anyways? And then what if in the middle of the worst economic turmoil that America had seen since the Great Depression, the shares that they were supposed to be holding started spiking because of government-imposed rules. And 
what if those rules also made it so that the SEC was much more likely to catch them if they happened to be allowing short selling against imaginary shares? There would really only be two ways out of the situation. They could go buy all the shares that they were supposed to already have on the open market, driving up the price as they did it, making the expense worse and worse at a time where banks definitely didn't have any money to spare, or if they could just find a way to get the borrower of those shares to cover his position, then he'd be the one going to the market and having to buy the shares, driving their price up. Hmm. Goldman issued a press release in response to the Cahotis testimony where they said that, quote, we met our obligations under applicable law, which isn't super confidence inspiring. It sort of sounds like saying, well, what we did was technically legal. And then they lean heavily into the idea that Cahotis himself categorized his accusations as just speculation and theories, which obviously they were. If he had proof, then he'd just be able to put people in jail. But here's the thing. Remember Sussman at Goldman? When Cahotis tried to get him to explain why these actions were taken, he reportedly said, and remember, Cahotis gave this testimony under oath, so technically he'd be committing perjury if he's making it up. Sussman said he'd never seen anything like it that made it sick to his stomach, and quote, sometimes when there's a house fire, you end up burning down the block. That sounds an awful lot like the theory Cahotis was putting forth. Ravi Singh wouldn't even say that. In fact, he never returned any of Cahotis' calls during the whole debacle. Something Cahotis describes as the most cold-blooded thing I've ever seen in my life. Now, maybe you're thinking, wow, Copper River really got screwed here. I wonder how they would have actually ended up doing that year. Well, you tell me, if you're Cahotis, whether this last fact makes things better or worse. There was a separately managed Copper River account beyond the reach of Goldman. It was much smaller, but it was following essentially the same strategy. And for 2008, full year, that fund returned 105%. If you take that return and apply it to the $2 billion fund that Cahotis started with, Copper River would have quite possibly been the best performing hedge fund in the country that year. Instead, they were killed by Goldman Sachs over the course of one week in September. Why? Maybe they were covering up a crime, or just trying to save money, or who knows, maybe they just did it because they could. Thanks for watching, guys.